Anyone have anything else? Can you guys hear me? Am I, am I loud enough in the back? Are there any other interruptions before I continue? <laughs> Ian. I'm glad you asked that, Ian. Let's get to it. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I've got to talk basically about what is Red Hat what. And first, we're going to go into uh, what is Red Hat about. I think most of us know, but it's not a given. Uh, you know, there's new faces around. So I'll just kind of go into what Red Hat is and what we're doing. Uh, I'm going to talk about what has changed over the last decade or so uh, since I've been involved. And uh, then I'm going to get into some of the changes uh, that are happening in Fedora, why we're doing them, uh, the basic what got us here won't get us there talk. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit more at the end uh, about some of the stuff that hasn't changed, kind of some of our core beliefs that we're still working uh, together on. And then there'll be some time at the end for questions and answers. Now, for those of you that don't know me, I joined uh, Fedora around 2005-ish. It was around Fedora Core 4. Uh, this is actually a picture uh, from the very first FUDCon I went to in uh, Boston. Uh, that is me in the back, just barely. Uh, I think my hairline is a little bit bigger now, but not too bad. And uh, from there, I went on to be a founding member of OpenShift. So it's a, a project that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, and I joined back to the platform engineering group at Red Hat, at least. Uh, which is the team in charge of building things like RHEL and Fedora. Uh, and now I'm here with you. So what, what is Red Hat all about? What are we up to? If you actually go to uh, our website, our company website, and go to redhat.com slash en slash about slash company, uh, you can look at this page for yourself. This is a copy and paste from the page. Uh, and in it, we have We Are Red Hat along with our mission, which is our mission is to be the catalyst in communities of customers, contributors, partners, or and partners, creating better technology the open source way. And for those of you that have been paying attention uh, this week at Flock, uh, you'll notice that Flock is a very special event for us because so much of our mission comes together in these rooms, uh, in Orleans and Cape Cod and, and here in the, the Grand Room. And uh, I think that's one reason why, A, so many redheaders come, because we, you know, we're very involved in this. Uh, but you know, in terms of you know creating our mission, there's really no better way to do it than in here with all of you uh, to you know figure out how to make the future. So what has changed in the last 10 years or so since I've uh, I've been a part of things? Well, in the early 2000s, around the time that I got involved, Red Hat and Fedora were kind of simple. I think if you go back in time and ask the 2005 me how simple the community was back then, I'd say it's pretty complicated. Uh, but the fact is, it was if you wanted to get involved, you got involved in Fedora. Somehow that became a Red Hat product. I don't know. There was a, a bit of a tug of war. Uh, but generally, it was, it, that, was, that was your options. Uh, now it's a little bit di different. You know, we've got uh, 2006 came JBoss. And so then you could be a JBoss guy if you wanted or a Fedora guy. And there actually wasn't a whole lot of overlap between those communities. But there was some. It was fine. Uh, if you look forward to today, uh, it's quite a bit more complicated. We sponsor many projects. Uh, these are just the things that go directly into some of our products. And I'm sure that we have people contributing to many of these projects. Uh, but if you go through and read these, not all, but a lot of these come together and touch Fedora in some way, either via being packaged in Fedora as part of our release, uh, or some of them are being run in the uh, Fedora infrastructure. And uh, you know, it's, it's complicated. And cer you know, certainly, uh, it's nice to see Atomic up there, which is a, a very forefront project of uh, of Red Hat, we had many atomic talks uh, at Flock this year. And if you go look at the, the full ecosystem of things, I actually had started to create a slide including all of these sub-projects as well, OS tree, Flatpak, uh, and, and that's just a lot of things that are very Red Hat sponsored. If you get into some of the outer ecosystem things uh, of just projects that we contribute to, like Moby or the Linux kernel, uh, I very quickly realized that I did not have enough time to put that slide together. And even if I did, it would not make any sense. It would be a cluttered mess of about a million projects, which is just absolutely insane to think about. And so this is kind of the environment that we're working in now. We have all of these different projects. Many of them came from different backgrounds. Some of them came from acquisition. Some of them came from inside of Red Hat. And uh, now we, as, as a company, are trying to figure out how to make these things work together. And we're hoping that the communities involved are also trying to make them work together. And so we love to hear about people that are able to cross different communities, uh, that have access to these different communities, uh, because 
I think over the next several years, better integrating and making sure all of these different things work together uh, is going to be very important. And uh, that, as it turns out, you know, integrating different technologies into a cohesive deliverable uh, is something that Fedora is very good at. And so, you know, the people in this room are in a very prime spot to make a difference there. But what got us here won't get us there. And so, uh, you know, even with our successes, uh, what we've built in the past is kind of starting to show its age. And so at the very highest level, uh, I know, you know, this gets very visceral to those of us that are actually trying to make this stuff work. Uh, but at the higher level, uh, you know, there's common, common complaints around making changes. And that's not just to Fedora itself, but to the infrastructure. Uh, certainly, we've learned a lot in uh, the modularity process, just trying to get things going, uh, trying to make the changes across several different teams and several different technologies. It takes a lot of work. And then once you have those changes in, it's really hard to communicate them. Uh, we have the mailing lists, which, you know, they serve a purpose, uh, but it's, it's, that's hardly like one-on-one -on -one training for the hundreds of people that uh, contribute to Fedora on a regular basis. And then you have the problem of what our users want. Some people want the stuff we have to go even faster than it is. Some people want it to go slower. Some people want some of the things to go faster and some of the things to go slower. I guess some people want some of the things to go slower and the other things to go faster. Uh, and then even more than that, we have these developers that are now coming in. And I know that we are developers here, many of us. But the, the opinions and the power that developers have going forward is different than what it has been in the past. And certainly Red Hat has noticed that uh, and is trying to, to make changes to it. And that includes things like developers being given large budgets to purchase software. Uh, that's just something that didn't happen in the past. It used to be the operators that controlled pretty much all of that along with their uh, CIOs and things. And so, uh, as Matt said in the first day, uh, you know, we've got to light some things on fire. And uh, that's kind of what we're up to right now. Uh, and by the way, if you do a, uh, if you're trying to do a creative comment search for a fire tornado, there's actually a lot of options to choose from, <laughs> which is amazing. And this one I liked in particular because there's, there's someone there. He's, you can see him here off to the left a little bit, amazed at the fire tornado, which is many times his size. But he doesn't look like he's, uh, he's scared or anything. He's, you know, he's taking it cool. And it's mostly protected. And I think that's what we're trying to do with this change, uh, with all of the changes that are going on right now. We're trying to do you know, a controlled burn of things, making sure, <laughs> making sure that stuff is working, uh, but we also know that tearing things down is hard. And I know that for a lot of people in this room, and myself included, there are certain aspects of this that are very uncomfortable because we know how things do work today. And it's hard to see how they're going to work in the future. It's very hard to see how this stuff is all going to come together to get uh, especially something like Fedora 27 out, which as far as I know, as of today, we still, anybody know if we have a successful compose yet of Fedora 27? Uh, and we didn't have an alpha this time. Uh, so yes, there's, you know, maybe a little bit of that fire tornado is wicking out at the top at the tree branches. Uh, and so we've got to, you know, and, 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 and it's fine. I think that the important thing is, we sh yeah, we didn't know. We thought the tree would be much taller and <laughs> by the time we got done. And, and, but the point is, like, I think the people that are going in and making these changes, uh, I think we, you know, we're, just keep in mind that we're all trying to do our best, both in the community and at Red Hat. And if you, if you have a problem, bring it up and try to show up and help because you know, certainly manpower is a big part of this. And uh, this stuff is hard. If this was easy, it probably wouldn't be worth doing or everybody would be doing it already. And so because this stuff is hard, sometimes we'll, we'll slip along the way. Uh, but now does seem to be a very good time to get some of these changes in. So uh, let's just dive in a little bit to some of, some of the very key things that are, are, are going on right now. Uh, one of them is Atomic, and so if you've noticed, there's been several Atomic talks uh, that have gone on. I'm just very curious, a show of hands, who here has actually just tried Atomic on their laps, laptop or workstation in a, in a VM, anything? Which is a lot of you. I mean, I think that's very good. And Atomic has done many things for us, one of which is, you know, obviously it's a container-optimized op operating system. If you haven't been paying attention, as it turns out, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, containers, pretty important to Red Hat. That's something that we're uh, spending some money on. So, uh, and Atomic as the operating system is what we want to be the, the best possible solution for containers. And as part of that, uh, Atomic, as you know, has this very small set of packages compared to the, the whole of Fedora. Uh, and that has allowed us to really focus on some of the core things. You have the kernel and OSTree and all the glibc and all the things that go into that smaller operating system. 
And I think that what we're really trying to do is use that as a launching pad for many of our other technologies. And so one of the big parts of that is this faster moving CI workflow that we, ha we have. Uh, as many that do pay attention, we release Atomic Host roughly every two weeks right now. Which is actually pretty amazing inside of Red Hat. It seems like magic to many of the people because you know in RHEL we're used to releasing that uh, most every six weeks with minor updates, uh, and Atomic gets quite a few sometimes. And so we're really trying to integrate that CI stuff to bring Atomic into a fully automated workflow that is tested uh, to bring that CI into a situation that we can actually trust, and uh, that's a really hard thing to do. Uh, as anybody that's tried it knows. Uh, in the meantime, we pretty much have Dusty and some of the other people uh, doing heroics to make sure that Atomic gets out every two weeks. And there's no real reason for that. Like, you know, it really should be automated, but it's a really hard task. Uh, so, and then on the container side, uh, when containers came about several years ago, uh, you know, with OpenShift we'd started with Gears, which was a very container-like technology. It was based on SE Linux. We have, uh, as it turns out, we have a lot of internal expertise on SE Linux. We have a lot of internal expertise sitting in row uh, four over there. And, <clears throat> but as it turns out, the industry did not, uh, did not widely adopt uh, Gears as the container technology. They, they picked Docker. And so we very quickly shifted to uh, adopting Docker and, and being able to use all of those images that are out on Docker Hub. And uh, very quickly found that Docker did not, uh, I guess, just as, as before, like making changes is a very important part of the thing that you invest in. And making changes to Docker has been very hard. Uh, you know, that, that Docker as a company um, has very specific needs that they're trying to address, and sometimes their needs are different than ours, and when it comes time to pick, you know, which one gets chosen, they pick their needs over ours, and that's a very hard thing for us to deal with and customers. And so we've been investing in several other technologies, like Cryo, and uh, so now we have multiple different container technologies we're trying to maintain, both in Fedora and in the community. And uh, on top of that, we have uh, other technologies like Flatpak, which is uh, you know, trying to, to build these containers into an OCI-type model, uh, but for workstation uses, which is not something that I think anybody was really thinking about when Docker first came out. Uh, you know, the, the workflow for Docker had always been for developers to get their enterprise software packaged and, and pushed out into servers. Uh, and uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of really good benefit to that. There's a lot of great lines of delineation between operations and developers in terms of what they can be uh, responsible for. Uh, but it also makes a lot of sense in the uh, desktop use case as well. And so, uh, you know, that is another one of those things that pushes some of the technologies that we're talking about to the limits. And uh, for those of you who are interested in it, you know, Flatpak is something I would encourage you to go check out and, uh, and get involved in. Uh, so I'd mentioned CI, and uh, I think, uh, I don't know if Steph is here. Steph, is Steph around? The Church of Steph, there's Steph. So he's currently leading a lot of our vision and thoughts around what to do with CI. And we have a lot of people in the room in Red Hat and, and in the industry who's used CI, who have used CI and kind of really understand where we're going with it. And we have just as many people that really don't understand CI, or at least don't see it as anything other than automating processes. And it is that. Uh, but it's also about changing your workflow and basically trusting the bots. Uh, being able to trust this tool chain is just as important as actually implementing it and having it work. Uh, if it breaks all the time, you're not going to trust it and you're going to continue to bypass it. And on the CI front, we're really trying to push forward uh, with the ability to make changes to Fedora. You can make changes to your packages uh, and make sure that you don't break other people's packages. And the whole goal of this isn't to find that out after we already ship it or after some customer puts that magic combination of packages together for the very first time and manages to see something break or worse. Uh, the goal of this is to make sure that the, 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 the changes that you make or the breakages that you may introduce uh, get caught before they actually make it into the full system. You want that as close to the commit time as possible, uh, which is just a concept that we had never had in Fedora before. And so uh, we have uh, the CI workflow that we're, we're working on uh, is now very heavily integrating with the factory 2.0 work that we have uh, because all this stuff is hard. And Fedora's uh, use cases, I think, are far more advanced than some, uh, some of the basic upstream use cases that we have. And trying to make all of this stuff come together is going to require a lot of effort. And so, uh, you know, I'm just, as, as one project, I think, that uh, is always looking for community effort, uh, anything involving tests, making sure those tests are up and running, uh, anything involving the CI work that we're doing, uh, that's definitely a great place to get involved and volunteer uh, because it's going to pay dividends uh, 
over the next several years. And I think it's going to make Fedora, uh, uh, I think it's going to make Fedora much more stable and faster moving at the same time uh, within probably the next couple of years. And really looking forward to that. Uh, the last up I have here is uh, modularity, which is something that we've all been looking forward to. Uh, I think that there's a lot of, uh, there's going to be a lot of benefit to modularity once it's in place. Uh, but actually implementing that and getting it in place has been uh, very challenging. I think uh, the, I, I think, you know, we'd all be more comfortable if it was a bit, it was a bit further along from where it is now. Uh, but uh, it's almost here. And, it, or I guess it is here. You can actually go through and build modules. I think that's still true today. It is. And so, uh, you know, if, uh, if, if you think that you want to build a module or you know one's coming, uh, we have Langdon, I'm sure, is around here somewhere. Petter's up here up front. Uh, go talk to them and figure out, you know, they, we can send you to the right links and, and get things up and going. Langdon's back there by step. Uh, and so you can actually start building these things now. They're there. They're ready. Uh, and you should start building them now. We know that uh, Fedora 27 is going to go out with some mix of modules and not. Uh, but that shouldn't stop you from building whatever modules you want at this point. And uh, when you start getting involved with what modules do and then what you can do with modules, uh, the future is very interesting there, not just for uh, Fedora, but the whole relationship between the Red Hat family of distros, including Braille and Sentoff. So what, what are the things that don't change? Uh, first of all, uh, you know, Fedora remains a foundation of everything we do in Red Hat. Uh, Red Hat supports Fedora because it's the foundation of RHEL. And RHEL is the foundation of the company. That's just how it is. And uh, unless uh, something like Open, you know, just speaking numbers for a bit, unless something like OpenStack or OpenShift uh, starts making the same level of money, or, or, or any of the storage stuff, starts making that same level of revenue that uh, RHEL does, uh, Fedora is always going to be front and center. And even when they do, those things are also going to install on RHEL. And it's just, you know, I'm, I'm just pointing out because it's very important to us, and it makes sense that it's important to us. It's just the reality of Red Hat. Uh, as of right now, we have 35 full-time people working across release engineering, IT, and QE. That number may actually be a little bit higher right now. We have many, many, many part-time people uh, that work, you know, that span across both Fedora and RHEL. Uh, it's often whenever a new invention or a new idea comes up uh, from a customer sometimes or elsewhere, uh, we start coding on it, and almost immediately the, the question a manager will ask or someone says, why, you know, why don't you do this in Fedora? And so they head straight to Fedora and do it there. Uh, as far as our sponsorship of it, uh, you know, we had the REL booth out there. We try to, to fund events like these and others as best as we can uh, to bring all of us together. And obviously, we also spend a great deal of money on the hardware infrastructure. Uh, Red Hat, you know, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Fedora furthers our open source mission. It's a pretty obvious thing, but it's worth repeating. Uh, you know, in terms of our mission, the one that Red Hat has decided to, uh, to follow, uh, you can do so much of it in Fedora, and it's a very healthy community to do it in. Again, Fedora benefits uh, our products in very profound ways in terms of what's coming, and uh, you should definitely be, uh, for anybody that follows RHEL, you should definitely be paying attention to Fedora because uh, the RHELs of the future look just like the Fedoras of the past. Uh, we also, uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of the communities that, that we would like to see and would like to build, we'd love to see a community that uh, considers the status quo a hurdle and not a goal. Uh, Fedora is not the place to keep things the same. Uh, and I think if, if you've gotten the impression that it is, hopefully uh, Flock and these presentations uh, this week have, have, have changed your opinion on that. Uh, we also would love to see a constantly adapting and evolving community. Uh, Fedora is never done. Uh, it just changes every time. And we try to put these milestones along the way going forward. Uh, but the fact is, uh, Fedora doesn't have an endpoint. It just keeps going and going. And uh, uh, I think that that, uh, that journey that we're all on is, is very important. I think that's also one of the main reasons why so many of us have been here for so long. And I'm actually just curious, who, who here, just a quick show of hands, or maybe even just stand up, how many of you have been involved with Fedora for more than five years? More than 10? It's astonishing. I mean, you know, how, how many, I, you know, if I'm trying to think of other things I've been involved with for 10 years, I mean, it's hard to think of anything else. I don't even think my electric company lasted 10 years. Uh, and so it's, it's really an amazing thing to, uh, uh, to see so many people that have been dedicated to Fedora for so long. How about, yeah, how about less than one? Who has been here for less than one? Got one on the end there on the left? That's good. Welcome. Yeah. 
roughly nine and a half more years to go, and then you'll <laughs> hit the 10 year mark. Uh, also, uh, we're hoping for positive, constructive uh, dialogue and feedback, uh, which at least in my conversations with people, and I think Matt, you, you might agree with this too, just in my talking with you, it feels like we've had a lot of that here this year, uh, which has been really good. Now, this, uh, this photo uh, did not come from the Creative Commons site, so I guess I've got to get permission from Brennan. Brennan, can I use this? We're good, okay. <laughs> Just in case he said no, I do have a, an air dialogue for the host. <laughs> so uh, I think, uh, you know, what we really want is this continued participation and growth uh, that, we, that we generally see. And uh, I think that's, you know, uh, that's really important to us. So uh, with that, I'll say thank you. And I've got just a little bit of time at the end for questions if someone has them. Uh, I'll come by and, and repeat them or uh, go ahead. No questions, everybody is very clear. Yes, Dennis. What's that? Ponies. Uh, they were supposed to be at Wackenhammer's last night. Did they not show up? After I finish talking, they're going to get the horns off. Got to get the horns off. OK, great. Well, uh, and, oh, there's one back there. Go ahead. Do I have anything to say about what Red Hat wants from Apple? So uh, OK, I'll, I'll just I'll level with you. Uh, Red Hat, as it turns out, is not just one shadow man guy with an opinion. Uh, I think Red Hat's opinions uh, on Apple are very nuanced. There are certainly a lot of people, myself included, that really like Apple. It has solved many of my needs in the past. Um, I have even seen uh, people in, internally at Red Hat you know, looking to Apple as, a, as a, just a proper vehicle of the Red Hat family of, of options. Because if there's a package that you want to get out, if it doesn't go into RHEL, where else can it go? Well, we could put it into Apple. We see some of that now. I think there are others, too, that view uh, Apple as kind of, uh, kind of confusing, uh, maybe confusing to customers, because we have this thing that works very well with, with, uh, with RHEL, and it's not always so clear. Uh, you know, it's really, you don't see a lot of Apple in the internal documentation and things. So it's not, you know, it's kind of an official project, but it's not fully uh, adopted and hugged uh, in terms of uh, its relationship with RHEL. And I think that's just kind of where it is right now. I know uh, I would love to see further uh, uh, investment and uh, uh, I guess dedication to Apple because I, I, I really think it's a great, uh, a great project. But today we just really haven't seen that. And so it, it's there and existing and, and basically thriving in its own right, as, as you can see from, the, from Matt's presentation and how it's going. Okay, well with that, enjoy the rest of Flock and uh, we'll see you around. Bye.